Do you think you'll do Cornish Cross or Red Rangers or um, anything specific like that? You know, <laughs> that seems like it would be a really easy question to answer. Those are the kind of questions that I literally lay awake at night talking to myself about because I see the benefits of both, <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. What are, what are the people here in Montana used to getting? 98.7% of them are used to getting a Cornish cross. Yep. And they're used, they're probably used to getting it on a styrofoam tray, all cut up and tidy and pretty. I'm sure there's a there's a pretty fair percentage who buy a whole chicken and they know how to handle a whole chicken, right? So let's let's put the cut up chicken versus whole chicken conversation aside for a second. Just talk about breeds. Well, if I do a Cornish cross, okay. I know I can get a saleable product in about six to eight weeks, depending on my customer base. I have a restaurant in Missoula who told me I will buy all the chicken wings you can make. I'm like, really? Okay, now I just have to sell the rest of the bird. <laughs> yeah, right? it's like what to do, what to do. Neat. So I have the, I have, I've sold, I sold two thousand chicken wings, but for a restaurant, I might consider growing ten thousand chickens because he could use them and he would pay me a decent price for them, and he might actually pay me enough that it pays for the entire bird and then I can sell the rest of that bird for much less than I normally would and still make a nice profit mm. that keeps the farm right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so those are the, yeah, so those are the kind of double dipping on birds. Well, exactly. So, so I mean, why not if they're willing to pay that price? Right. So they don't have to buy it. Exactly. So the therein that leads me to the conversation. Do I want a, fast growing bird I can turn quickly in six to eight weeks or do I want a more flavorful more chicken like behavior bird that doesn't have the physical limitations of a, of a Cornish cross but takes 12 sometimes 16 weeks to hit the same size that a Cornish cross does in six to eight my cost to keep a bird alive for 12 to 16 weeks is a lot more than six to eight weeks. Yeah. The feed ratios are probably not the same. So I'd have to experiment by raising both side by side and get the real data to know for my property in this climate, doing it the way I do it, what are those two side by side costs to better understand the decision? All that aside, I really like the idea of chickens acting and behaving like chickens. I've never been excited about the Cornish cross, the way they just sit and, you know, they, they lounge around waiting for the food to show up. I like chickens because of what they do. They dig, they scratch, they hunt. They, you know, I like all those behaviors. Um, but I'm also torn because I also like a fast turnaround. And if I can make my money back in six to eight weeks, that's a business question I is that a principal thing? Is that a business decision? <laughs> I guess so, it's both. It's both, right? And, that, and th that's why those conversations keep me up at night. Because it's not like I'm agonizing over it. But sooner or later, I'm going to come to the decision-making process. I've got to order my thousand chicks. And I've got to schedule them out. And I've got to plan it. And I've got to build my my you know chicken tractors and get all the pasture ready. And get the brooders set up. All those different questions, right? So... Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. And I, I've done both. In Oregon, I raised uh, Red Rangers. I also raised uh, a, a local version of a Red Ranger. I don't remember what they called them. Um, and then I did okay. Cornish Cross all side by side. I did 30 of each side by side on the same pasture, same food, everything. And I processed all 90 birds the same day, which was a huge mistake. <laughs> The Cornish crosses Whoa. were four to six pounds a piece. All the other birds were two to three pounds a piece. Just tiny, hmm. bony, scrawny little critters. They needed six more weeks, eight more weeks to really get fully fleshed out. And that was a rookie mistake. So, but it proved to me 
that the duration of the raising period is an important consideration. And if I'm going to raise a heritage breed or a more chicken-like breed, a natural chicken-like breed that walks around and clucks and does its thing, it's going to cost me more money. And that's a question I need to answer for myself. Am I okay with that? If I have a customer willing to, to compensate me for that extra cost. And I, right. It goes back to educating the customer again. Like it does. You go with what they know. Do they like tasteless chicken? Right. Like, because that's what they know. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to say that, you know, the things that you do on your farm, like make it tasteless. That's just how the breed is. Like it's, uh, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, they're just, exactly. no, no fault to of just the person put on growing. weight like crazy though. Right. Yes. Right. There's only and, so much and, you can do. And, and, and that statement you just made, there's only so much you can do when affecting the taste of the bird. Raising them on pasture obviously helps. Raising them with organic feed obviously helps. Every little incremental improvement helps. But let's change yes. the conversation a little bit. There's only so much I can do to educate people about all the different stuff I do. <laughs> right? So why should I buy your beef? It's from that, that silly white cow that looks smaller and it's from, is it British? You have a British cow? Right. I mean, there's I have a hurdle to overcome just selling my beef. Those are cute little pigs. You mean you sell those for meat? They don't root around. What? There's another hurdle I have to overcome. Um, you raise your chickens out on the pasture. Don't they get eaten by coyotes and eagles and stuff? Well, no. And you feed them organic. Don't they just eat the grass? Why do you have to feed them at all? That seems like that would be cheaper eggs, not more expensive eggs. Another hurdle I have to overcome, right? Yeah. So how many hurdles do I want to build in my way? <laughs> because every decision like that is, I, I, I have the control. I could raise things conventionally and take away all the hurdles. And just say, look yeah. at this great six pound bird. It's $1.29 a pound. You should buy this. And there are folks in the Valley that do that. And that's great. And I'm not living river farm. They, they do it the right way in my opinion but there are places you can buy a whole chicken grown in montana and they sell it for 99 cents and i have no idea how they can afford to do that unless they're just using processes that and, and systems that i won't use which is fine that's that's their prerogative that's their their, their business decision, business decision so anyway so those are the kind of things that that's why that simple question of red ranger like those birds cornish cross like those birds different reasons don't know i don't know yet i guess i may do both i mean not to go <laughs> i guess not to get uh too far into uh you know hey like let's 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 hash this out right now you're gonna make a decision by the end of this show um but I guess it depends on who you're really trying to market to. If you if you're trying to go like wholesale wholesale to restaurants and whatnot, or are you trying to pick up people that um, that are buying a dozen or two dozen eggs at a time? You know what I mean? Right. I guess that right. like who who are you trying to market to? And the way you currently operate your farm, like you you already do things just like a little different, like for the better, obviously. So like, so then it would almost be out of character to go with the Cornish cross over the red Ranger. Like, I, but I mean, obviously that's not up to me. It's up to you. It just be like, Hey, this is why we picked it. It's a better thing. And eventually you, you, like your customers, your current customers train your next set of customers. Like, hey, I love buying my meat from Grace and Rome because they do this, they do that, they do this, and they do that. I, I love all these things that they do. And so, like, there's almost no way for you to screw up that sale if that person is like, you know what? I am tired of buying crap meat from the grocery store. I want to get it from somebody local here in the Bitterroot, um, you know, 
hey, you know, that that burger or that steak or, um, you know, the uh, the bacon that you that you had the other day or whatever. Who's that guy that you use? Oh, yeah. You know, give me his number. I want to I want to check him out. Right. Yeah, they. Uh, I think it, every farmer who raises food of any kind, whether it be a vegetable or grain or an animal, has to make those decisions for themselves, right? So you, you brought up a good point. Is a Cornish cross, let's back up. Is my objective as a farmer to grow the best possible food I can, I can grow or the best possible version that I'm growing, right? Is a pastured, organically fed egg the best possible egg I can grow or the best possible egg there is. You see, you understand the difference that I'm saying? Yes. I could probably invent a grain <laughs> over the rest of my life and develop a feed that blew away all the other feeds or work with scientists and how far do I want to go? Right. So I'm, I'm playing it out to the nth degree for example yes. purposes. So with the tools I have, which are locally grown organic feed, which is in my personal opinion, the best feed I can find on a pasture that is really, to be honest with you, lackluster from a quality of forage standpoint, I'm producing the best egg I can grow right now. And I'm able to explain that enough to people that they're willing to pay my price of six to six ninety nine a dozen. So, which, I mean, if I'm honest, <laughs> my lay rates are not great because I have heritage breeds mixed with production breeds. And so the number of chickens, lay rate for anybody who doesn't know what that means, you take the number of chickens and you divide that by the number of eggs you get every day. So if I have 300 chickens, and they lay 200 eggs a day. That is a what? 60% lay rate. I think that's the number. 150 eggs be, would be 50%. So half as many eggs as there are total chickens to lay them. That would be 50%. And so you just divide the number of eggs by the number of chickens that gives you the rate. Lay rate. My lay rate is somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50% right now for 325 chickens on pasture. You complicate, so I'm feeding 325 birds and I'm only getting 160-ish eggs a day out of them. That makes my cost skyrocket once they hit yeah. their 80%, but, but they're still young and some of them haven't even started laying yet. And so I'm feeding chickens that aren't making me any money and they're not giving me something I can sell, um, but they will. And once that time comes... Now my profit line goes up. So take that, move it over to chickens. Am I in a place where I desperately need the income going back to our conversation around privilege in my particular situation, or do I have the latitude to grow a chicken that's going to take 12 to 16 weeks to mature and become a, a saleable size? It's going to cost me more, or I can make it not cost me more by cheapening the food, not using the organic feed, right? I mean, they're all just cogs. You can adjust this lever and this switch and this dial and get an outcome you want. So it doesn't feel as black and white to me as, well, you, you, Joe, you say you're a guy who likes to grow the best, best food possible. Well, that's true, but I can grow the best Cornish cross you've ever eaten. I believe I can do that. Is that the best chicken you've ever eaten or will ever eat? Are there better flavored right. chickens? If do I should I grow um, pheasants or quail because they're they're more delicious, right? I mean, yeah. Where does it end? And, and that's the kind of the, those are the conversations that I have with myself. <laughs> and and that's how we that's how we settled on. I I don't like to grow commodities. I like to grow premium products. Sometimes it's a product that does not exist elsewhere. I don't know of anybody who's raising pastured chicken or pastured eggs, excuse me, at the scale that I'm doing 
and the scale that I plan to do. I don't know anybody in the Valley that's doing that. So I feel that that's a premium egg compared to my competition. Is it the best egg on the planet? I have no idea of knowing that, but it's the best egg I can grow. And I'm taking measures to make sure that my animals are well cared for. The ground is respected. The ground is improved by their behavior and their, them being there, all those things. I make a little bit of money in the process and I can keep going because so I'm not profitable. It's all just a big dream and nice. It was fun for a year. It's an expensive hobby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So then meat chicken, same thing. Can I grow a really to get course, a kick-ass Cornish cross chicken? Yeah, I absolutely can. Will it be demonstrably different than a neighboring farm's Cornish cross chicken? I don't know that the average consumer would know, but I know. I yeah. know what goes into that chicken, right? You know, so so then the then that if I'm if I'm gonna make that decision, if I'm gonna sell a chicken that looks just like the chicken that's selling for a buck twenty nine in the grocery store, with the same conversation we just had. I have to go back to consumer education and tell them why this chicken is worth five to six dollars a pound instead of a dollar twenty nine. 